Hi, this is LameGuy64 of Middle Tech Productions and in this video I'll be uh, showing you how to set up the DTLH2000 PlayStation development boards into a Dell Optiplex GX110 running Windows 2000 using the NT Desi drivers to get the boards working under an NT environment. Uh, I wasn't able to get this video made earlier because my ISA expansion board hasn't arrived yet for this computer because usually these GX110 systems don't have ISA slots but you can buy a replacement uh, expansion board that contains uh, ISA slots which is uh, mandatory to be able to install the DTLH2000 boards and yeah I've been very eager to upgrade to this uh, system in a while especially since uh, if you've seen my earlier videos I've mentioned that my existing uh, DTLH2000 system uh, had uh, start, uh, boot up problems. There's a, mother, a problem with the motherboard that uh, uh, where you turn it on it doesn't display a video whatsoever until you wait a minute or two or until the system has warmed up a bit. Uh, very annoying and also the motherboard doesn't have enough expansion for me to put things like network without sacrificing the sound or graphics card. So without further, further ado let's get to this shall we? I got this computer from someone who needed it repaired by me five years ago uh, but during that time period I didn't have much uh, SD RAM or extra parts lying around to fix this so I wasn't able to get this working for him uh, again for him and it was just lying about uh, for a bit till I eventually uh, started work on this to try and get it restored and I was and the problem was just the memory and uh, uh, the owner used to uh, come back here from time to time to check on the computer. Eventually, he seems to have stopped uh, because the computer was uh, hasn't been fixed yet. Still, I imagine that he realized the computer is uh, at at that point uh, already pretty much obsolete, as in uh, Pinchum three system in year 2010-2011, uh, not so useful and relevant nowadays. Pretty much. That's, mo that's the most li likely reason why he stopped checking and pretty much abandoned this computer he to me. To me. Uh, because while it's obsolete, and rather than having this computer lying around doing nothing in his household, he just handed it over to me, uh, most likely. So yeah, it, this computer is pretty much mine now. Uh, this computer is mostly stock, though it had a uh, couple of upgrades uh, when I received it. The computer came with an Intel Pinchum 3 uh, running at 930 MHz and it had two CD drives, uh, the top one I've replaced with a 5 and a quarter inch because the original drive that came with this computer which was a light on CD-ROM drive uh, was pretty much useless and it doesn't read discs very well anymore so I swapped it out with a 5 and a quarter inch uh, drive because why not and it looks really nice while I'm waiting for getting a drive bay adapter to so I could put in a 3.5 inch uh, zip250 drive instead of uh, this and then the second drive that was added here was also was a was also like this a light on DVD ROM drive but this is uh, my own drive actually this is not the one that came with the unit uh, the one that came with this unit still works but uh, the drive belt that uh, drives the CD tray was already bad so I had to swap it out with one that uh, works fine. Uh, the system also had two hard disks. One is this, both are Seagate, both are 20 gigs. But the second drive was a uh, kind of a hard disk range that Seagate produced that was uh, covered in rubber, a rubber lined hard disk. But sadly, the second drive I think died. I'm not sure. Maybe it's still working. But uh, it contained copy of Windows XP if I remember correctly. Or I formatted it and on the back you see your IO there the fan of the power supply and fan of the CPU your, your legacy IO that's no longer present modern computer serial parallel your PS2 ports and USB 1.1 down here we got our VGA which is driven by an Intel 810 graphics chipset uh, which is more potato than the Intel HD graphics range Ethernet, which is driven by a 3Com Ethernet chipset, and the your audio ports, which is driven by a Soundmax uh, chipset. And yeah, 
and also the memory for this uh, it came with 256 megabytes of RAM I think uh, but I imagine that uh, I think it was already upgraded by its original owner because this or one of its previous owners because uh, this thing uh, the memory chips were of different brands usually in OEM systems that come occupied with two slots already both would be branded by the same company uh, so yeah let's get into this let's open up this sucker and see what's inside as with most Dell computers you can easily open them without the need of a tool unless someone left a padlock on the back of the system that prevents it from being opened so to open the Dell or this computer you just uh, unlock the case lock here push this button the cover should pop right open I also forget to mention that I've added a bunch of upgrades uh, to this system uh, such as uh, I removed the the two uh, 20 gig hard drives and replaced it with a 40 gig uh, Seagate hard drive let's just zoom in so you can see much better what's in the guts system also, the Dell, Dell computers uh, during this time period had an interesting cooling mechanism. I'm not sure about the later systems though. But in this case, we have a shroud that, that directs uh, airflow from the case to the heat sink, CPU heatsink and just pushes it out through the fan right over here. I think of that as a really clever way to cool the processor because um, you're not contributing to ambient heat inside the system. You're immediately expelling the heat from the CPU directly out. So the ambient heat inside the system will be much cooler than a regular fan on the heatsink that blows air everywhere. And yeah. So all the cards on this system are housed on a card cage. And then there's this uh, stock uh, PCI uh, expansion board there. The upgrades I've added to the system are a, and you just uh, pull that green tab to pull the hard cage out. It's a bit squeaky, but can easily remove it. So what I've added into the system prior to getting the ISA, expan ISA expansion card uh, board is I added a Avermedia. M160 capture card. My idea is that with this capture card I could just wire the AV out of the DTLH 2000s which I'll be installing here eventually. Wiring it directly here and then just see what's going on on the boards within my within the same monitor that I use the PC side on. And I also have a Sound Blaster Audigy because the Soundmax Soundmax sound chip is pretty crap. I don't like uh, Microsoft GS Wave tables. Absolutely rubbish. I also added a USB 2.0 card and this is the game port slash MIDI connector for the for the Audigy. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take these all these cards out and replace the expansion board with the one that I received in the mail. And so let's get to that right about now. Okay, the expansion board has been replaced and wow, it looks so freaking cool with this uh, complete uh, expansion board. ISA, we got 5 ISA and 4, I oh know, 4 ISA and 5 PCI. And it's very, and it's shiny and has that brand new motherboard smell. Uh, because this was a brand new old stock uh, part. Uh, interesting thing is that unlike the PCI expansion bus uh, board which has pretty much nothing except maybe a few resistors this one has an additional chip here I imagine this chip is meant to provide an ISA bus which is no longer present on the motherboard in the system so yeah also um, as long as you have an ISA slot in at least two ISA slots in your computer that you want to install the DTLH2000 boards to it's most likely that they, the boards will work on those um, you don't need the DMA support whatsoever. The boards will work fine with just the IRQ and uh, address space set up correctly. And yeah, there's also the DTLH2500, which is a 
PCI version of this thing but those are a lot rarer than the H2000 and then now that I got four ISA slots it's possible that two of these will be occupied for the H2000 and I will have another I have room for a 2700 performance analyzer board and maybe another board for the for the um, SCSI CD-ROM emulator card I don't plan on getting the, the CD-ROM card or the performance analy analyzer because those things are re really rare and uh, performance testing using my own tricks methods is more or less good enough for my needs so I just put the voices back on to this uh, we're gonna f I think I already mentioned this but before we uh, install the boards we get a test if the PCI cards installed will detect on the Dell and then once that's confirmed we can proceed to transfer the boards hmm also this I really I actually like this card cage design of the of this specific Dell system because uh, it's very it's, it makes it much easier to access your expansion slots like yeah for example you're in an office environment and then you got you need to add a new expansion card or remove it or replace um, you don't need to bring the computer up to a table and then put it on its side to gain access to the cards instead you just on this system you just pull out the the card cage and you got all your accessories in there also this card cage has the proper uh, support supports for very long expansion cards which uh, my DTLH2000 needs on my old system I used a piece of wood with some cut grooves to as a support but I don't like it, it looks like a noob job and also there's a chance that when I transport the system uh, around in like say a car it might break and the boards will flop around and possibly snap so yeah let's put this card kit back in and see if the accessories I've installed detect in the system BIOS okay after a while of fiddling about I finally got my Dell up and running reason was when I this unit didn't have the memory it had because I transferred it to my old DTLH2000 system and when I put it back in it wasn't displaying until you install the memory in a way where you have the power supply raised so you could access the upper part of the memory slot better I think that's the reason why it wasn't working but I finally got it working fi uh, in the end so I need to set up the BIOS let's see if we had if our expansions are detected so RQ reservations uh, yeah, this is a feature that's very important in when you're installing a DTLH2000 because you need the interrupt that the boards are using to be reserved so that no other device would get in the way and possibly screw it up and give you a blue screen. So, okay, uh, we got our Sound Blaster Odigi there. We got our EC USB adapter, and then we got. Rook Tree Corp. That's the that's the uh, display adapt. Now the capture card. So what are we gonna do? Is we set IRQ10 as reserve. I'll reserve it to to the DTLH2000, and then we gotta make sure that no other peripheral gets in the way of the IRQ that the DTLH2000 is working. So we got no PCI device detected in IRQ10. So, and then I'm also gonna uh, set this to see, power recovery off. Turn it off. An interesting feature about these Dell computers is that it has a sensor where, if someone had previously opened the computer, it will warn you. You can see it here. Chassis intrusion. You could disable it, or enable it, or say silent. And you also got CPU serial number, which I think is so that when someone swapped your processor, your Pinchum 3 with a slower on, you'll be alerted that someone did that. So you won't be left wondering why is this computer running slower than normal when someone swapped your processors. 
So we got the yeah, 933 megahertz Pinchum 3. So since now, now that the expansion board is working, we are going to install the DTLH 2000s in the next cut. Okay, now next thing we do is to remove these DTLH 2000 boards from my old rig. And first we have to remove this uh, scuzzy like interface connector. I gotta do it very carefully. I don't wanna do it haphazardly. We tug that out. You have to be very, I think it's much easier to do it here. I don't know. I want to use my left hand. This. Oops. Sorry about that. Now let's. How do I remove? Okay, it's now giving, getting way, giving up way. Oh my gosh. Okay, it's fine. Okay. I don't know where the crunchy sound comes from. No, ribbon cable's fine. Connector is fine. Well, a bit damage on the sides, but I think that's common with these H two thousands when they get pulled out. Moving these connectors are a big pain. Uh. Well, these boards aren't really perfect anyway. There's rust developing on it. Some rust on the I.O. panel. So I'm gonna sell and shop. We can unscrew the boards. And then we can now pull them one by one. First is the I.O. board. I'll board out. The size of that thing. Next is the CPU board that houses the processor and GPU and memory. That. Okay. Bye bye, old rig. I don't know what will be your fate in the future. So here's the DTLH2000 and all its glory yeah, from psxdev.net. As you can see, it's all chock full of chips in both boards. And then there's the ex adjustable su extender supporter uh, for going into here. I've got my old rig set up here where I have just a piece of wood to hold the boards steady. So. Yeah, get the CPU there, GPU. The I.O. board responsible for the controller ports and CD-ROM. Um, I imagine this is where the you'd connect your CD-ROM uh, DTLH to NT10 or 2510 to. Uh, maybe you could also, you'll also connect the CD-ROM emulator board to this. Uh, as for this one, I think that's where you connect it to the performance analyzer board. I'm not sure about this one though. And of course this one goes to the CPU board, and vice versa. So yeah, let's install it to the card cage and yeah. Now that is what I call freaking badass. It looks like something you'd see out of an old uh, SGI workstation or something. Like a vintage uh, supercomputer or vintage uh, vintage workstation PC. Also, see how tight that fit is there. Thinking it fits, but yeah, it look it looks awesome in, in the outside and the inside and seeing the inside. So, what I'm gonna do now is to test fire. Uh, we're gonna have a small TV here to see what the DDLH2000 is outputting. Uh, we're gonna uh, once the PC is on, we should see colored bars because that's the default image that the DTLH2000 will produce. So without further ado, let's see and hope for the best. Power.
screwed it on a... Ah! You think it could be a bad cable? Uh, maybe. Give me a sec. I'm gonna go grab a cable here. Hmm. Oh, video. Move it around. Yeah, I think the cable is the problem. Let's see. Yup, the cable is definitely the problem. You can see it's displaying color bars, which is a good sign that the boards are happy. Or running, basically. So, well, I currently don't have a second cable to use. And my monitor doesn't have a cable. I'm using the cable from this monitor. And, uh... Uh, maybe in the next part I'll be trying doing the actual testing because I don't have the materials at the moment and I also need to go to school shortly for an OJT but anyhow see me see you at the next part so apparently I wasn't able to go to school today because no one was to be left at home and no one came until it's a long too late so anyhow we're now in windows 2000 already booted on my dell with the h2000s installed already closed up the computer now next thing we need to do is to install the drivers of the boards which are to be used with code warrior let's see if we have yep we got code warrior already extracted and then in the programmers tool cd you find a folder called desi Go in there and you find PSX NTISA. That's our driver. So we open up, but before we install it, we have to open up the INI file first. Then we go to ISA RQ and set that to 10. Then ISA address 1340, that's already 1340, RQ 10. That's my settings, so save that. Then we right click the INI file. Or is it INF? and we install and we reboot and it should appear as PlayStation in the device manager because of this it would be it actually it could actually be possible to get the DTLH2000 to work under Windows XP and possibly even Windows Vista and maybe even Windows Vista and 7 32-bit because uh, uh, they still have some degree of ISA compatibility left but Windows 2000 I think is recommended because it's closer to the old oops sorry about that closer to the old Windows NT 4.0 architecture yeah I don't get why Microsoft didn't, move, uh, didn't abandon the 9x architecture immediately and just switch to NT Maybe because NT was still new, perhaps, I don't know. So the next thing we're going to do after this is that we're going to use PSCOM Util and see if we can communicate with the board. Then I'm going to try to hook it up to my TV and see if there's going to be any output. And this camera doesn't tend... Uh, thread with uh, CRT monitors very well, flickers like seizure inducing. Uh, okay, now we go to device manager and no, not there. Can't really point the camera at the screen, so we got. Where is it? I'm trying to look for it. Very annoying. Maybe this only happens when you're recording at 60 hertz. But uh, let's see, hardware wizard. Mm, add device. The reason why we had to do the driver install manually is because the boards are not plug and play compliant. Uh, I think I need to record at 30 FPS for now. Apparently, to see the D PlayStation driver already installed, it's apparently in the category non-plug-and-play drivers, which you can 
which is made visible by going to view and, show, and turning on show hidden devices. If you right click and click properties, it should use the resources it uses should be ARC address 1340 and interrupt 10. So now that the driver is installed, next thing we need to do is to use PS Commutil and see what happens. I was able to get a messy copy of Cold Warrior R5 through the Assembler Games forums. It's not a complete original copy though, but it has the tool enough it has the tools necessary to get the boards up and running, but we cannot do things like debugging yet because the files need to be uh, uh, the PlayStation debugger plugin needs to be crapped to be able to work. That read preferences, okay. Wait. Uh, now I need to configure communication preferences. Set to H2000 ISA. Enable stop command. Turn off that because we don't have a CD ROM. Ignore that. Change patch file to. Uh, maybe never mind. So let's save it. Connecting to PS1. Yay! It's working! Oh my gosh! It's working in Windows 2000! Mission is established. Now I need some software to test it. And I also need to hook it up to my TV right over there. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, my TV is set up and ready to go. As you can see, there's some for some reason there are a bunch of blocks there. But that, that seems to happen when you use the Desi drivers for some reason and PS Commutal Trash Code Warrior. I think it's supposed to display some text, but it's not displaying correctly for some reason, but it still works nonetheless. So what I'm gonna do is that I'm gonna run a simple test program I made to test the Gorod shading of non-textured and textured polys because apparently there is a uh, graph GPU revision where the Gorod shading looks like garbage. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to program, download and run, and we're gonna select our CPE from my flash drive, it's in shade test, and loads there. Oh my gosh, it's working! Yay! <laughs> awesome. So yeah, it's possible to get the H2000 working in Windows 2000 and possibly Windows XP. The only downside is that the only tool that can, the only programs that can do so is uh, the MetroWorks Code Warrior, which uses the PlayStation Desi drivers, but not the SM System uh, debuggers, which is the one that's most commonly used in the, I imagine, the PlayStation development community. It's, and it's also the easiest to work, unlike MetroWorks, where it needs some, some patching to get to work. But, yeah. It works nonetheless, so I'm gonna try to load a different program and see if if the joystick ports are functioning in the in my and yep the controller is working fine too. Well not really surprising because uh, if either if both the PIO and uh, control and CPU board don't communicate well because of bad connection then there, there would be no video most likely, or go just not execute. But hey, yeah, it works. <laughs> I can't believe it actually works in Windows 2000. And also the PC file server, uh, no, the, not the PC file server, the, the printf messages are also working too. So yeah, it's pretty much fully functional. The only thing that isn't functional is just the code wire IDE and debugger. Uh, currently, we can't, I can't get it to work because I, uh, the program needs some cracking for it to actually compile uh, PS, PXE executables, so yeah. Maybe at a later time. For the meantime, I'm going to install Windows 98 on this and use that instead. Because currently the code wire debugger is not, uh, code wire is not very useful at the moment. So yeah. And there you have it. That's how you install and set up the DTLH 2000 PlayStation Development Board Set onto a Dell Optiplex GX 110 running Windows 2000. Well, the reason why one would use Windows 2000 instead of 98 is simply because Windows 2000 is newer, much more stable, 
and through some hackery it's possible to make some latest programs work on on Windows 2000 but the only downside with using Windows 2000 is that the only uh, debugger you can use to actually do debugging which is what the DTLH 2000 was intended for which uh, regular stock consoles cannot do at all is through the MetroWorks Code Warrior uh, currently we need uh, it needs to be patched before we can use it but uh, th but my friend Matt who runs the PSX Dev forums is uh, working on a patch to get the uh, to get code wire to be fully functional and also um, so for the meantime the only debuggers we can use for now is the SN systems debuggers which I think only works in Windows 98 most likely because uh, the SN system debuggers would direct, would access the boards directly and not through a driver which Windows NT based operating systems such as Windows 2000 don't like at all so yeah and if you have uh, if you're working on installing a DTLH 2000 yourself if you somehow manage to get your hands on one that's actually functional uh, down in the description of this video you'll find a link link to a PSX dev forum thread that uh, show that uh, contains documentation and information needed to set up said boards such as the wiring for the controller adapter I made, the wiring for the uh, video cable for the t to connect it to the TV, etc. And also the jumper settings of the boards in an event your your motherboard, uh, one of the uh, peripherals in your motherboard is occupying address 1340. Um, you can also find information about that there as well. But anywho, that's pretty much it for this video. Like, comment, share, and subscribe if you want. And so, well, yeah. Lame guy 64 is signing out, and see you later.